can AI be conscious in the same sense as I've just been discussing it about some level of complexity that instantiates something independent? At least, you know, probably not now, right? Mm -hmm. Or not in our more immediate future. Can it replicate what we think is consciousness? Very likely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you already have seen the arguments of, about Google, mm -hmm. right? And that thing that, you know, that program is, you know, I don't think it's conscious, but, you know, it, it was pretty remarkable. It was a far more interesting dinner conversation than I've had with even some of my professor friends from Harvard and MIT, right? I mean, much more open and, you know, interesting. I would love to have someone like that as a conversationalist, mm. right? So now where does the transition happen for us? Well, again, I mean, I, I, I hate to boost his already immense ego, but not that he's listening to this, Elon Musk, you know, basically, I didn't say stole, but borrowed the concept of neural links from science fiction, this notion that you can interface and access compute abilities. Mm -hmm. We do it already. I mean, Wikipedia is like, a, you know, I, I, everybody's an expert if they can type in the search terms and get a w Wikipedia concept. Imagine that being instantly available to your head. It's an upgrade. It's an upgrade. Imagine, you know, something which is recording your every moment so that when you say, where are my keys? The, you know, the, the compute in your head said, I see, I saw you leave it on the table downstairs Helpful. and it flashes that image to you. Sure. Right. That's coming, right? It's coming one day. And so we've now transferred our memory, much of our capability of the memory to the computer, let's say in some near future. Um, it could record your life. So now, I mean, at 61, I can barely remember some of my former dogs. You know, I can remember them, but I can't remember the moment that I just had with two of my dogs in bed this morning, petting them and, you know, okay. loving them. Um, but maybe I could recreate that. So I've now transferred memory, emotions, uh, and the, re the recreation of those memories and moments to a computer, what's left? Hmm. Maybe just the decision processes, but then maybe we start to give the decision processes over to the computer. What should I do today? Well, here's the most efficient way to, to do all the stuff that you're doing. So we become smaller and smaller and smaller. And what we've handed over to an AI is larger. And so at what point do we decide as humans that we don't need that anymore? Because most of what we are is now in the computer. I would say that we, that doesn't have a soul, at least if a soul is true. But, you know, maybe that's what we are seeing in these UAPs, because it's a natural extension of where we're going. Unless we create laws that stop it from happening or there's some sort of a pogrom, pogrom uh, or a crusade against them, it's coming. Mm -hmm. And so we will transfer ourselves over. And then, unfortunately, people like Musk would live forever. <laughs> fortunately, people Sorry, like you would. But fortunately, people like you would. Yes, that's, that's true. Yeah. Unless he turns us all into, into slave robots. But... Um, well, anyway, a computer, the danger is control alt delete, you know. Control that's also, delete. That's also I mean, also a danger. I mean, I'm believe me, if Elon gets something that uh or somebody else, there's other people as well, just using him as an example, um, get something that allows for memory aids, I'll be all for it. If it doesn't, you know, if it if it doesn't like destroy my brain in the process of upgrading you know, and that I can't upgrade further at another point, I'll do, I'll do it. What about intelligence upgrades? Oh, sure. And in increasing the data that you have on board. Right. So yeah. you're a fan of some of the potential of Neuralink. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you've heard me probably talk about where does creativity and insight come from and where are we accessing sure. these downloads that people get? 
Have you ever had that by the way with oh God, your work? Is it, does it feel like what I've, I'm glad you said that because it seems like a lot of really brilliant people end up actually backing up into an idea that they had originally and then figuring out the, the essentially the math to it. And so mm -hmm. what are, what are some of those? Well, there are many that? books written about this and going back decades about how people have realized that they just get these ideas out of nowhere. I think that if we transfer ourselves to AI, mm -hmm. we'd lose that. Yeah. I'm implying that there's some woo-woo associated with where we get these ideas from. Right? I mean, I'm, let's not, I, I won't parse words. Uh, you know, you, you could imagine that it's some sort of subconscious process that truly is just all mathematics or there's something else going on because some of the ideas that I've had came from absolutely nowhere. There's no way I would have known what these things were before I thought the idea. Um, so it's like, okay, well, did somebody give it to me? Or, you know, I, I don't like to think that there's a guardian angel or somebody out there who really cares about me personally. Um, or is there something about the way you structure the question mm -hmm. that, and there's a, a saying, I can't remember if it's a, a, a Zen or a Buddhist um, concept, that the perfect question is the flip side of the perfect answer. That if you structure the question in just the right way, the answer is obvious. Huh. Right, that the 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 question almost presupposes the answer, and so maybe if the physics of the universe is some people say it's an information physics, if the physics of the universe and it can traverse time, let's say, uh, and let's say that we don't understand enough about the universe to say that it can't, um, then if your brain puts together a, a conscious structure that is the question. It might be asking and, you know, it might be querying the universe for the answer. So it's your executive function of who we think we truly are that organizes the question in a way uh, in our brain that create, creates the query. Mm -hmm. And it just takes time and the right moment right. for all of that to have come together to the, the answer comes and boom, it gets downloaded because it was already there. Yeah. Right. And it's not that anybody's giving it to you. It's you're giving it to you by creating. And again, it's all postulates. Where does it come from? What do you think? Speaking of questions, what do you think is the most important question that humans can ask? Are we alone? That to me is the most important question. If we're not alone, then somebody else might have answers to other, let's say, less or more immediate existential uh, questions, right? That, you know, what what can we do about this? What can we do about that? Or, you know, are there other dimensions? Are there, you know, you know, what is, you could list a thousand questions and, you know, if they would be willing to give us the answers, right? <laughs> and I personally think that, frankly, we're not, I mean, I've said this before, I think we're just a bunch of angry, um, angry apes. I don't think we're ready for uh, some of the answers yet. And, you know, it's like you don't tell your children certain things until they're mature enough. And we have pretty much proven that we're still not mature enough yet. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, evolution, as I said before, doesn't care about time. DNA doesn't care about time. We're sort of the first level of civilization that was achieved out of competition, right? The tribe that was more competitive than the other and frankly, more aggressive. Um, and that frankly had, you know, narcissistic psychopathic leaders that were willing to unite mm. a continent, you know, at the expense of blood, uh, were the ones that succeeded. Mm. But as we're seeing played out in today's politics without getting political, um, that's not necessarily a survival trait for a species. Right. It's short-term win, long-term loss. Long-term loss. So is, is the long-term play for evolution, the creation of a certain level of complexity that either realizes it needs to get rid of that aggression, or there will be a collapse, uh, a rise, collapse, rise until the genetics is selected for that Ooh. 
is an interesting study that was done. And I don't remember uh, who did it and whether it was validated or not, but it was shown that um, in women after wars, uh, that there were, it was more likely for the women's boy children to be homosexual. Interesting. Okay. Why? Okay. What? And the, and the postulate was, uh, that they would be less aggressive. And so there's kind of an encoding in the woman to fear of a problem. Mm -hmm. times of stress that, okay, we need to lower the aggression in the males because they're getting out of control. Okay. Now, is there an, it, does this happen? It, there are certainly other cases showing that the grandmother who is starved has a baby. And if it's a woman is epigenetically programmed to have a child who is more likely to gain weight. So there's this, it's, it's an epigenetic programming event. Yeah. You can, you can basically, it's, it, it, you know, there was a big thing between Darwinians and Lamarckians back in the day. Lamarck was a, um, his idea was that a giraffe's neck gets longer because it was reaching for it. Okay. And somehow that gets encoded into the DNA. Sure. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, you know, that was discounted for, you know, almost a hundred or so years. And yet now we find these little subtle hints hmm. that, in fact, Lamarck wasn't entirely wrong. So, you know, and, and aggression can be moderated, apparently. I, and I don't know that being gay is, is the right answer, but maybe there are, it doesn't need to be gay, you know, just less aggressive children. Sure. Right. Um, and or less likely to want to fight over the females. Hmm. Sorry to bring all that in, but it's, you know, that's that's our history. Um, and so, you know, so there's a, there's sort of a self-regulating capacity, uh, in human society that is at least epigenetically flexible. Um, and that we, you know, if we, if we think of, of us having an absolutely determined outcome, it's not quite right because our genes right. epigenetically are listening to the context. And so there's a little bit of flexibility built in there. And that just makes sense from a, you know, to build that in from an evolutionary standpoint is to, you know, you remember you're, you're trying to build in solutions. Um, and if the solution is to be a little bit more flexible to turn the meter up or down a little bit, you don't want it hard coded, you know, cause hard coding of genes takes a long time to evolve in. But if you can hard code in a rheostat, then um, that listens to the environment and it mostly is going to come in through the eggs and less likely to come in through sperm because the eggs are more complex. Uh, you can basically say that the woman as a sensor is the one that provides the egg and the ability for the next generations, at least most immediate generations to be modulated a little bit. Mm 